John Iwata, who runs all of corporate communications for IBM, has been a real good friend of the lab and of this project. And so, because he couldn't be here, um, we asked him to kind of give us a, his view of this space. And so this is what that is. At IBM here, I lead the marketing and communications organization. As we've been talking to uh, Ernie Wilson and others at Annenberg about this so-called third space, we see our needs changing because of the way that we engage people change. We define communications pretty simplistically here. At its core, communication is not about information. It is about causing people to act on what they actually believe. The third space describes some new skill sets like collaboration, like empathy, like uh, intellectual curiosity, adaptability, and one that I really agree with, which is uh, what Annenberg calls 360 degree thinking. All of these things we're finding to be new requirements of our professionals. How do you discern what you should pay attention to because it is something that will be here and it will really make a difference? And how do you discern it's just something that will come and go critical thinking? And so a few years ago, we tried something different at IBM. We struck a collaboration with our CIO. We took a floor, we gutted the floor, and we built a lab, a marketing and communications lab. Multidisciplinary teams, different kinds of skill sets and experiences have to work shoulder to shoulder. In an organization of, uh, of the size that we are, you have to do formal training, you have to do assignments, you have to do it all because you need to rapidly get the skill in place. They have all been trained on the agile method of development, that's a capital A. It is a prescribed way of working using digital techniques to rapidly create digital media and engagement methods and put it out into the world and to see how people are actually responding to these things and then quickly iterating and improving them. They're putting out apps, they're putting out campaigns. The person who, who's, whose idea to create the lab is Van Edwards. He was a reporter with The Economist. He was a journalist. And then the publisher of TheEconomist.com. He bridges the world of understanding how to engage people with compelling content, but digital and data and this new method of working. The lab has proven to be very successful because we see the, the deltas, the improvements in effectiveness, in response rates, and how much time people are spending engaging with us. I don't care if you're trying to reach politicians or customers of beer and cars or your own employees. I'm trying to reach you and to persuade you to take an action that I want you to take. That's an art. It's, it's becoming more of a science. I'm a big believer, uh, as many are, in, liberal, in a kind of classic liberal arts background. The importance of critical thinking has never been more important. If I went to USC or Stanford or any great university and I wanted to source the skills, I would exhaust myself walking between the buildings. I would love to get a little bit of liberal arts training, business acumen from the business school, behavioral economics and behavioral science. I would love to go to the D school in Stanford and get a lot of designers because they are structured problem solvers. Another one that is a unexpected to me is epidemiology. You know, anthropology, strangely enough, is a very interesting place to source people who understand people. You can't major in data science today. You can't major in marketing science. I would love for people to get a degree in marketing science, right, where they could, they could get some of the traditional marketing communication skills, a uh, half a cup of data uh, data analytics, third of a cup of behavioral science and behavioral economics, and you know, a heaping cup of liberal arts. I would hire them all day long. Cool. So can Chuck, can you bring up my PowerPoint? So um, while they're doing that, let me 
introduce my colleagues. Uh, I'm John Taplin. I'm the director of the Annenberg Innovation Lab. It's a multidisciplinary lab that is centered in the Annenberg School, but has research faculty from the Viterbi School of Engineering, uh, the Cinema School, the Education School, the Music School, and the uh, new Dr. Dre, Jimmy Iovine Academy of Coolness. Um, uh, Steve Canepa, who is, happens to be on our board, has run the media and entertainment practice for IBM for over 20 years uh, and uh, has really understood the analytics revolution probably better than anybody in the industry that I know. Uh, Dinesh Morjani uh, is the executive and resident of Warburg Pincus, and before that, he ran Hatch Labs. And Hatch Labs was a VC and, you know, brought us Tinder, which you may not know about, but I promise all your kids know about. <laughs> um, so, our topic is corporate strategy is talent strategy. And uh, so, the Innovation Lab has, over the last five years, worked with all these companies. And they've sponsored our work. And I can tell you that every one of these companies thinks a lot about this talent gap that Ernie has raised. Uh, so when Ernie first showed me this slide, uh, and all these competencies that he felt, uh, <laughs> he, he said, you know, this is, this is important stuff for talent to know. And I said, well, of course. Um, so I said, basically, this makes sense to me. Because as some of you know, uh, I come from the music business. And when I was a very young kid, I was lucky enough to work with Janis Joplin. Um, and so she was talent in my days, right? And she showed empathy because she sang the blues. And to sing the blues, that's the core of empathy. <laughs> she was culturally competent because she was unbelievably sensitive to the great African-American tradition of music in which she was just allowing herself to stream into. She was intellectually curious. I swear to God to see her after a concert with Allen Ginsberg and just trying to understand where Howell came from, from this young girl who never went to college, really, was fabulous. She was totally adaptable because she was a woman in a world that was totally dominated by men at that time. You know, now all the big singers are women, but I promise you in 19... 67, that wasn't true. And as far as 360 degree thinking, I think she embodied that because she just wanted to learn everything and go everywhere and be into, and you know, maybe that was part of her downfall too. So Alex Madrigal, which some of you know, writes an amazing column, which if you don't get it is in your inbox every day, called Five Intriguing Things, used to work for the Atlantic, and now he's going over to Fusion, says, somehow we've been convinced that only machines and corporations make the future, not people and ideas. And that's not true. Just take a look back at history from the mid-century futurists projecting that we'd be living on Mars with their stay-at-home wives playing pinochle in all white communities. So it's obvious that the futurists who think that technology is going to rule the world are wrong. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things I say to Ernie is, it's very obvious that some very successful people do not have third space competencies. <laughs> I would say that Donald Trump does not excel in empathy or a cultural competence. And even some of our great technology leaders have not really exhibited third base skills. If you've read the Steve Jobs biography, you understand that he was not the most empathetic person in the world. 
But that doesn't mean we can't try and teach these skills to the next generation. And I think some of this is what Denise and I are going to talk about next. So when Ernie and I first went up to Apple to get their support for the Innovation Lab, when Steve was still alive, John Couch, who was probably employee number 26 of Apple, said to us, culture eats strategy for lunch every day. And we really believe that. Next slide. And Eric Schmidt has just recently published a book about how Google runs. And his whole theory is that what Google needs is what he calls smart creatives, which is another way of saying what Ernie's saying. And his theory is this starts with culture. Smart creatives need a place to care about where they go to work. And this is a problem for those of you who run very big companies. You have to have a place where young millennials will be really engaged. And so you plan your culture early, think about and document the things you care about as a group, the way you work and make decisions. So with that, thanks. Uh, let's, let's kind of start, OK? So I'm going to just start with you, Dinesh. Um, you're a venture capital investor. So what is the balance when you make a decision to invest in a company between a great idea and great talent? And what are the, you know, what is more important for you, some kind of cool idea or some kind of talent that really grabs you? Uh, it's, it's a great question. Uh, it, a couple comments before I uh, share my, my view on that. One is that uh, I'm actually more of an operator than an investor, although I've fallen into becoming an investor at Warburg Pincus in a private equity role, which is growth equity investing, later stage companies. And I'm an angel investor, but, but at my core, I, I build companies uh, from ground up. And um, there's actually a different answer based on uh, where you are at the stage of a company. Um, from an underlying philosophy perspective, there's no question to the point about culture versus strategy. Um, the team is the most important thing, uh, hands down. Uh, as opposed to necessarily the idea, because in almost all cases for venture development, uh, startup creation, and even large organizations that have evolved and evolved their business model, um, they're going to have to pivot. And it's the leadership team that's going to be driving that. So their ability to have 360 degree thinking and then evolve that over time is incredibly important. The idea is important, not to say it's not. Uh, there has to be a sound business model. But I think the underlying financials of a business, the underlying um, economic value that's created and harvested eventually uh, in a growth equity company sometimes tends to be more important than the team because the team is sometimes swapped out for uh, the equivalent of third space thinkers um, if the team has gotten from an early stage startup to a growth equity company um, with good leadership, but then you need to change the leadership to get to the next level. So it does depend on the stage of the company, but as a universal philosophy, I would say the team is far more important than the idea. The ideas always change. So Steve, <clears throat> here you are at IBM. You're trying to recruit young kids with third space competencies that have come out of schools like Annenberg or USC. And, and <clears throat> you've got these young startups that are dangling unbelievable equity packages in front of people. and and the possibility in the brains of young kids that they're going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. And um, how does a company like IBM compete with these startups in, in attracting talent um, to a more established firm? It's not easy. And there's, every day there's um, more and more companies, more and more opportunities. Um, and I, I think the competition for talent is only going up. I think there's, uh, I was thinking about, what, you know, some of the discussions I've had with people who have recently come into our company, and I think there's three things that we tend to focus on that I think do matter. Uh, one is relevance, um, the second is innovation, and the third is actually how we, we work. On the relevance side, I, I assume everyone here has probably seen our Smarter Planet uh, commercials over the last few years. Part of, we're a B2B company, so you don't see our brand every day. Uh, although, like in our industry, every time you play a Blu-ray disc, you invoke IBM technology. Or in the last generation of game consoles, whether you were on a PlayStation or a Wii or an Xbox, you were using an IBM chip. Or every time you go to the bank and do a transaction, you're, you know, something's hitting an IBM system. So we're there. But because we're a B2B company, our, our job is really helping 
educational institutions do a better job of educating or businesses do a better job of serving their customers or cities doing a better job of serving their citizens. So relevance, I think Smarter Planet helped because it showed how the things we're doing to make our water cleaner or our energy more efficient or to make uh, doctors uh, better uh, when an electronic medical record can travel with you to a doctor's office, things like that I think make it relevant. And people I think like to work on things that are relevant to their life in the real world. On the innovation side, um, we're constantly innovating. We're a $100 billion company with 400, 450,000 employees in 140 countries around the world. But in the last 10 years, we've shed, we've divested of two, uh, $20 billion a year in revenue. So, so if you, you know, divested of that. At the same time, in the last five years, we've acquired some $19 billion in companies. So we're constantly, as a company, trying to innovate. And when we do things like Watson, as an example, so now you, know, you, you can walk into a doctor's office in the most remote part of South Dakota, and the doctor can see someone with symptoms that they've never seen before, and they can turn to Watson and have Watson instantly go across the world and look at the latest, greatest, newest reports and information available around the symptoms that that doctor's seen in, in their office for the first time and come back with some ideas about what those symptoms might be and, and what might be a proper diagnosis or what are some of the options that the doctor might want to think through in assistance to the doctor as they go through the process of diagnosing that. To me, that's really pretty amazing. And you get to work on those kind of projects. So being in, in innovation, I think matters. And then the, the final thought for me is how we work. So I'll give you an example of a project we just did recently here with one of the studios in LA. Uh, as you know, box office is really tough to predict today. Uh, in the old days, you used to spend $150 million to make a movie, $75 million to market it, and you'd have a few weeks to recoup that investment in a box office and, and, and maybe even start to make a little profit. Now, Thursday night, midnight, that screening happens, the audience leaves the theater they start tweeting and texting and blogging and sharing with their friends and influencing what happens. And your movie could soar or it could be essentially dead before the weekend even arrives. So uh, the kind of project we work on is we, we get together with the marketing department and we, we take all the data they historically had on surveys and social groups and, and uh, screenings and all the comparative analysis they've been doing since the, all the time they started first making movies and we add in algorithms that can begin to look at relationships between data sets that aren't necessarily intuitive and we, uh, we add in Watson-like capabilities to make those models get smarter and smarter and then we add in a whole new class of data around social analytics and what people are actually saying and who your audience actually is and we start getting better. At, at being able to predict what that box office is. Well, to do a project like that, we'll bring people in from all over the world. We'll bring in people from our research lab that are work on psychographic analysis based on the way people communicate. We'll bring in people from our software group that know how to mash large data sets together and look for information. We'll bring in people from our industry group that understand the context of that business. Uh, we'll bring in people from our user de design labs to say, how do you visualize that kind of information in a way that's relevant to, the, to those marketing people that are trying to make very hard decisions about where they allocate their spend. So working in that kind of way, um, bringing people in from different disciplines, bringing people in from different cultures, from different points of view, I think makes for an, an interesting environment to work in. So some of those things I think help us uh, in presenting an opportunity, uh, one, one of the benefits of being quite so large is if there's something happening interesting in technology, somewhere in IBM there's someone working on it. So if you have a passion in an area or, or you like working on challenges that matter or you like working on things that are relevant to the world, those are the ways that we try to present an interesting opportunity to people. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've noticed is that uh, IBM is such a diffused organization and it builds kind of work teams to a project. And I, I, I remember some one guy who was in Olympia, Washington, somebody else was in Austin saying, well, we have to wait till the guy in Mumbai wakes up to get the X third input here. So obviously the notion of cultural competence seems really baked into the organization in terms of this kind of very diffused organization. It's not all in Armonk, is it? 
No. Um, the, the, we, we tried to make a conscious shift um, over the last 10 years or so from being a multinational company to being a truly globally integrated enterprise. Um, and we're actually trying to help many of our customers make that change as well. And part of the benefit that comes, I, th I think, you know, a lot of my stories relate back to the media industry, but if you think about the animation and effects business, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to be in that business, you had to be in some building on some studio lot uh, with a whole bunch of other people that had the same exact skills. Now, if you happen to be in Korea and you're a really good design person on animation and effects, you can work perfectly well with a global team of folks that are working on the next release of a movie. Technology, you know, not only is the world flat, but the world is connected now. So the ability to get to the right expertise wherever it may be and be able to get that expertise integrated collaboratively in a project that has you know, some designed outcomes, I think is really powerful. And so when we think about a globally integrated enterprise, we think about how do, how do we, there's really three dimensions to our business, which is geographies, brands and products and services, and then the industries that we actually operate in. And so how do we get the best and brightest out of those dimensions of our matrix to go to work on the right problems for the right customers? So Dinesh, um, in my slides and everything, I, I, I noted that, and especially has been in the news recently, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about Gamergate or anything, but, but you know, Many young CEOs in the technology business seem to be missing the empathy and cultural competency aspects, Gene. And I, I know you had to either fire a CMO at, at Tinder who didn't d display those competencies. <laughs> um, how do you bring these competencies into people who have kind of grown up in an engineering culture, probably very male-oriented. Um, how do you make that happen now? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, a, a few thoughts um, on that. Uh, and, and just to, to clarify, um, although I can't talk about the lawsuit and I wasn't uh, involved in it, um, I can tell you that I didn't hire that individual. Um, <laughs> and, 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 I, and the second thing I can, I can say is um, that uh, in that particular case, and it's important, this is the context for, for sort of answering part of this question, is that um, when uh, the person who claimed uh, that she was unlawfully terminated, there was an actual sexual harassment, unlawful termination, um, uh, she claimed to be a founder of the company. Well, I can tell you, I didn't know what she looked like till two years later when I saw her picture in the, in the news. So it gives you an idea that people are making false claims and um, the media jumped on board right away and supported her. Well, this is a, um, a woman who's been essentially um, taken out of the group and, and not given the opportunity to be as successful uh, in a fraternity-like culture. Uh, and the fact is, she was effectively like an intern. <laughs> she wasn't. Uh, she certainly wasn't a founder of the company. Um, and, and that's an objective point of view when I'm not even involved on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. Um, and of course, we're talking about Tinder. Um, with, with that said, I think the issues are incredibly important um, and uh, when you look at bringing in talent and creating an environment and a culture of success within an organization, um, I find that first you have to understand what are the boundary conditions for that particular startup. And that startup doesn't just apply to Silicon Valley startups. It applies to startups and new initiatives and <clears throat> in large organizations. It, it applies to the innovation lab that you have. Um, you're essentially bringing together cross-functional teams and trying to get them to create something magical. And the starting point for that is understanding what entrepreneurship is. Um, at the end of the day, you're trying to achieve a set of goals with insufficient resources to do so. So how do you bridge that gap from insufficient resources to getting to enough resources? There is, there's really only three levers, and they're, they're non-mutually exclusive, people, time, and money. And um, I've talked about this a lot, but time and money are fixed assets, effectively. You sort of know how much time you have. Uh, maybe it can be stretched a bit, but it's effectively fixed. You know how much money do you have to work with or how much you've raised. Um, people are the elastic asset of innovation. Um, and if you don't have in every discipline, whether it's engineers, designers, product managers, in the case of a typical software venture, it could be something else, um, having 360-degree um, thinkers, people that can think in sort of third space environments, um, you're not going to have the explosive cocktail of innovation that unlocks value, that bridges the gap between insufficient resources and getting to what objectives you have. So the underlying 
uh, meaning of a, of a startup is essentially a hypothesis that has to be proven or disproven, has to be tested. Um, and to rapidly test in sort of an agile development environment and put something out there requires that type of thinking. So fostering an environment that allows people to unlock that innovation and be explosive is really important. Um, and the way I've done that traditionally in the past is we put together an operating manifesto. So when we recruit, um, we have a clear set of both values that underlie what we do. Uh, in the case, for example, of Hatch Labs, um, which is a, an incubator to build new tech startups uh, uh, focused on mobile, it was, uh, it was do your best, share everything, and root for others. So very simple, easy to communicate, and we could tell very quickly if someone uh, mirrored that value system, and that was very important to us because we couldn't work in an environment where someone didn't. The second thing is the operating manifesto. Things like concepts of Kaizen, continuous improvement. If we ran a meeting and we have 30 minutes and you know, in, a, in a given day, like many of you, you know, I'll knock out 12 to 15 meetings outside of my normal day job, which tends to be more of a night job. Um, when you finish your meetings, um, you have to have achieved whatever objective there was. So you set up with an agenda, you jump right into the meeting, um, everyone's fairly succinct and get, gets to the point, but if you haven't achieved your goals, um, clearly you didn't run the meeting well or you were missing some input, whatever it was. So we actually had uh, a process, a Kaizen, continuous improvement, uh, it's a Japanese word, focused on if something didn't go well, let's fix it. I'll give you a, a tangible example. We used to use a software called Clear Gears that was about 360 degree feedback. And it was a great idea, this sexy SAF software that everyone could use and they'd get pinged about giving feedback on a real time basis to all their peers, colleagues, uh, people they report to, maybe an engineer working for them, whatever it might be, even though we operated fairly flat. And it was such a great, sexy concept and design. We used their beta product. But we found over time people weren't using it. So it didn't fit into the way we worked on a daily basis. So the classic example would be, well, let's force people to use it. It's, it's such an innovative, progressive piece of technology. But if it doesn't work in the way people do it um, on a daily basis and what they do, you have to change it. And you have to constantly change everything you do to make it efficient and achieve the outcomes you want. So we actually got rid of it. And I sat down with Jack Welsh, and he walked me through how he evaluates people. And we applied that to what we were doing. And it was actually a paper and pencil approach as opposed to a sexy piece of software. In this case, technology didn't solve the problem. It was about the underlying thinking um, that made performance reviews far more effective. So what I'm getting to is having a value system and operating manifesto sets the foundation. And then applying that in a way that's very pragmatic and fits the systems, people and organization that you have is, I think, incredibly important in order to hire the right talent and identify that they're matching how you're going to run your organization. You know, I, this is really fascinating because you, you're basically bringing this top-down, bottom-up question to bear. Because in certain companies, there could have been a mandate you've got to use the software and, and you know, just forcing people to do that. But you basically were listening to the edges, you know, and, and uh, Irving Ladowski Berger, who is really, quite frankly, the father of the Innovation Lab, who was IBM's VP of software, uh, of internet, right. uh, in the 90s, when the internet was really just starting, told me a story that uh, he was with Sam Palmazano, who was the CEO, and, and Sam Palmazano said, we have to lower the center of gravity at IBM. And what he meant was, we've got to get this notion that everything's controlled from Armonk headquarters out to the edges so that, so that we can listen to the edges and so innovation can happen to the edges. So Steve, you know, a recent uh, survey by publicists said that 83% of millennials expect businesses to have more social responsibility. And so clearly these third space kids um, are interested in this notion of corporate social responsibility. That, that they're not just working for a company to make money, but that they actually could do something. Um, and in some ways, we're finding out that it's becoming embedded in law in India. If a corporation doesn't do something good and put it back to the company, they don't get to operate there. So how does, in this era of CSR, how does this fit with this notion of attracting third space talent? And what does IBM do in that, in that space? Well, I, I'm, uh, as you know, 
fond of that uh, quote you put up earlier about culture eating strategy for lunch, because I think especially with a, a big company, um, I think oftentimes with smaller companies, startups, you know, companies that are growing quickly, you tend to physically be in proximity with a lot of people on a regular basis. So I think in some ways it's maybe easier to shape or continue to refine a culture. For, for a big company, I think... Um, the, at least for IBM, there's been three things that we've done that I think have helped. Um, one is to be really clear on what our strategy is. Um, the second is to have a framework that can develop the principles and, and the, the type of culture that we, we wanted a, a, as our company. And the, th and the third is some methods to actually reinforce that. So uh, from a strategy standpoint, I mean, our, if you ask almost anyone in IBM, they will hopefully tell you that there's three key things that we think are fundamentally changing the world and changing the industry we work in. So um, one is cloud. You, we all hear cloud every day, but it's not about the technology. It's about changing the way that business happens, to changing the way you interact with people, to changing the way that products and services get to market and the time to value and all those things. It, it's influencing almost everything. Uh, uh, the second is data. You know, uh, we think of it as like oil was the to the last century, data is to this century, and the only difference is data comes in unlimited volumes. Uh, you know, in the last two and a half years in the world, we've created more data than existed from time beginning up till then. So this acceleration and, and being able to take that as a natural resource and refine it into information and ultimately with analytics to get insights out of it. To, to us, that, that very clear strategy. And, then the, and the third is this whole mobile social integration. The, the movement from demographics or groupings or, or organizations to really individuals. Everything we all do uh, you know, on a daily basis, how, how does it impact us? So I think giving people to work in that strategic context helps. Uh, and then we have a framework. We have what we call our 139 framework. So we have a one one vision, three values, uh, and nine uh, principles that that we continually reinforce. Um, uh, the ambition, uh, the purpose to be essential, to really be a company that's essential to the world and the way the world works. The values, there's really three, is trust and responsibility in every relationship, um, doing meaningful work for our customers, and, and uh, innovation that matters for us and for the world. So those values, I think, help clarify what we're about and, and what a millennial could expect uh, to come to work with IBM. And then I, I was going through the principles actually last night, um, looking at uh, you know kind of the key um, at third space competencies that, that Ernie and the team have, have developed. And to me, it kind of struck me. Uh, so in the client success area, as an example, we, one of ours is uh, listen for need uh, and, and envision the future. Well, to, it sounds a lot like empathy to me. Um, one is um, uh, share experience. Uh, sounds a lot like 360 degree thinking. Um, you know, w one is uh, get to um, shape the future now. And I think that's a lot about cultural sensitivity and knowing what's going on. So anyway, it, as, as I went through these principles that is what we use to reinforce those values, I think you could see those kind of third space competencies kind of underpinning a lot of what those principles are about. And then the last point I would just be, so then how do you make that real? Um, well, we have a collaboration hub inside the company that essentially, no matter what dimension you're part of, you can collaborate on that element. We have collaboration around these principles. We have uh, programs like Think Fridays, where we literally expect our, everyone in our company to take time and dive into one of those principles and apply it to something that's relevant to what they're doing uh, in their work. We, we have a, a fairly structured uh, personal business commitment program that says every year, um, every organization, every individual who's part of that comes up with a set of objectives for themselves with regards to what they do to contribute to their business, what they do to contribute to those values as our company, and then what they do for themselves. Um, to build a, their career. So I think some, some of those methods that we use are reinforcing. For, for us, um, the company, you know, if you go back to the days when I first joined it, you tend to join very young and you tended to stay and you tended to move up through the ranks or find the area of the business that you were interested in. Well, today, a huge percentage of our population, we're 420, 430,000 employees, but a huge population of, of, of our employee base has been with us less than five years. So we're not unlike any other company in the marketplace where we're constantly 
having people come, people go, right? So, so it takes, I think, processes and, and methods and tools and consistency to continually uh, reinforce those cultural points. Great. So I, I just want to end by asking Denise first and then Steve. Have, have you had any practical suggestions for Dean Wilson uh, of what Annenberg could do to help teach these third space skills to maybe non-communications majors? In other words, could we bring engineers in or could we bring MBAs or people who haven't been immersed in a communications culture? Are, are there would there be seminars or, or even working professionals? Have you got some thoughts on what we could do? Uh, a lot of thoughts. Uh, I'll try to keep it uh, brief. I, I think you've already embarked on that process, one, by starting the conversation, two, by um, offering classes at Annenberg X like uh, the one I teach um, on leadership and new media ventures. Um, so I think you've begun that, that conversation and, and put the foundation together. If you wanted to take it a step further, I would um, begin working with the other schools to recruit uh, interdisciplinary classes. Um, and uh, the goal would be really two things, uh, twofold. Number one is put people, um, to some extent, in a pressure cooker. Um, so they're forced to work with um, not like-minded people um, because it makes them far more effective in um, sort of in a post-academic environment to deal with the incongruencies that happen in terms of thinking, in terms of operations, in terms of personalities, social norms, et cetera. It'll make them far more elastic and effective. Um, I, I sort of describe it in my class as put yourself in the most uncomfortable situations you can and try to overcome those adversities because your pain threshold will dramatically increase. And when you do that, um, everything else becomes easy. I was a, I was a chemical en engineer in, in my undergrad, and I used to work two work-study jobs at the same time. Um, my MBA and, and everything I've done professionally all feels like a cakewalk compared to my undergrad. So uh, if, if you can increase your pain threshold, I think that um, that'll make you a more effective leader. And I think putting people in that pressure cooker is helpful. Um, and that can be done through internal hackathons that you can have. It doesn't mean you're developing software. It could be cultivating an idea. It could be an architectural design for a new building on campus. Any sort of pr pressure cooker type environment where it's cross-functional people who don't think the same. Um, and then the second component of that in the twofold view is that try to establish relationships, which you've already done. You've set the foundation for, for fellowships when people graduate. So if um, post-graduation rates for employment are, uh, are not as high as they really should be across the country, uh, USC has the chance to create leaders with real-world experience in fellowships with real companies. We did this at Hatch Labs with uh, NYU through the Tisch program and, and through, um, particularly through ITP, um, which was an interdisciplinary program in itself, and we found that those fellows were very successful. So that sort of creates um, continuity in both the academic environment to work in different environments, but then to create a, f uh, a fellowship or some sort of working environment, almost like a co-op program, but it's interdisciplinary and it allows people to be successful and create a catalyst for what they're going to do in the workforce. So we just have a couple of minutes. Does anybody in the audience have a question or a, for the panel a, or a contribution, a thought? Is not, yeah. It's, um, I, I think the point I was making earlier about the, the way we tend to work now, um, if, if I were to contrast uh, just kind of the day, the day in the life, um, we, we have an interesting methodology. We, we call it journey mapping. And we use journey mapping with our customers and we use it internally. And, and what we do in journey mapping is we say, if we're working with a customer on a project, we'll say, okay, that end user or that whether it's an internal person or it's a customer, what's the journey they're actually going to go through to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve? We, we do it inside the company as well. We think about if, if, if we want, if the outcomes we want are people with interdisciplinary skills, the ability to collaborate well, the, be, the ability to have, um, uh, to, be, to bring whatever their expertise is into an environment where they have to learn how to cl you know, collaborate. In, in, uh, we actually um, spend time on thinking about how can we do developmental ac activities uh, for our employees to kind of build those muscles, if you will. So I think that's one example of what we do. Uh, and, and we have a, um, it's really pretty amazing. We, we have a very uh, uh, 
a multicultural organization, you know, being global as we are. Uh, and we tend to, people tend to move within disciplines quite a bit now. Uh, and I think that's another way that we kind of nurture that. Yeah. Um, th there's so many things. I'm, I'm going to just pick one because we talked about recruiting and talent and, uh, and we touched on topics related to diversity. Um, when you're running an organization uh, and you're evangelizing, again, your value system or operating manifesto, whether you're doing it officially or unofficially, you assume the edge points of your organization all reflect those values and communicate those externally. So let's say you're recruiting and you find someone incredibly talented. Um, could you have missed someone incredibly talented because the edge of your organization, the recruiter, the, uh, the product manager, the engineer, had a personal agenda? They were worried about their job. They were worried that um, this person would show them up. They were worried that um, their team dynamic would change. Um, people don't think about human agendas very well, and this is, the, this is the ultimate point. You have to think about their human agenda and create an incentive system that encourages the best behavior you want to get. Um, that has to be ingrained in the culture, but it has to be um, explicit. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if I'm, I think I'm allowed to talk about this. Uh, so I, I've, I had an offer at Google back in 2006. I turned it down uh, when I went to IAC. But uh, later on, Google's tried to recruit me numerous times. And, uh, and I've never actually made it through the process. So I'm, I'm clearly not a, a good uh, innovation uh, person to go work at Google. And, um, Every time I interviewed with someone, whether it was a director or a VP, I, I sensed, and this is about EQ, talk about 360 degree thinking and, and empathy and understanding what's on the other person's mind. By the nature of the questions, their tone and their voice, they're concerned about something and it doesn't have to do with my answer. It has to do with an agenda they have. And the result is they end up missing out on bringing someone in. Now that's maybe tooting my own horn and I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to say is the edge of the organization may not reflect what Eric Schmidt, Larry, and Sergey have in mind in terms of the talent they bring in. Now, I have no interest in working there, but I'm just giving you an example that um, the organization has to be in tune. So you hear one thing from the leadership in, or, or of an organization, but the way it's actually run and how those va the values and the agendas manifest themselves are very different. And it's rare that someone like Eric Schmidt's going to be down sitting with the recruiter and talking to them and really figure that out because people have vested interests, they have agendas, they have tenure. These things matter even though it really should be a meritocracy. Great. So thank you so much.